Matthew chapter 8, that's where our text will be found today. We are continuing our, uh, that the march we'll be looking at, what I've called the unsung heroes. Uh, talking about some of the lesser known characters of scripture. People like today, whose whole story in the Bible is recorded in five or six verses. Uh, does not take up a lot of pages. You look at the life of Paul, Paul gets a lot of, a lot of coverage throughout the New Testament. Uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, Old Testament Joseph, all of these are tremendous people. We have so much to learn from them. But like I said last week, there are these hidden gems in God's Word. And from time to time, we need to slow down and, and learn from one of them. Uh, easy to, to focus on kind of the, the headliners. Uh, figure today teaches us a lot. But again, all we read about this man is is concealed in just a few verses, but nonetheless, he's got something to teach us today. And today we learn from a character who's not even named. His name is not even given. He's just called the Roman centurion. And we'll talk a bit about kind of what that means or how that would break down. Uh, but his, his name's not even given. But he teaches us a lot about what it means to have faith in God. What it means to have faith in God. Now, we all exercise faith every day. All exercise faith every day. Uh, most of us are here this morning because of our faith in God. Because we have some level of faith or trust or confidence in God and the work of Jesus Christ. Now, that starts, that faith often starts with our salvation. But many of us would say that it extends beyond that. That our faith in God goes beyond just the work of, his, uh, of the salvation he has offered us. We have faith in people. We trust that the people around us, uh, the, the ones we love the most, are going to be good to us. That they're going to treat us right and have our best interest in heart. We exercise faith in our vehicles. You know, this morning, I didn't leave two hours early, two hours before I wanted to be here, just in case my vehicle broke down and I had to walk. No, I had faith when I walked outside and started it that it would start and it'd get me all the way down here. Fortunately, it did. Right? But we all exercise faith, sometimes without even knowing it. Um, faith, it's another one of those words that we use it a lot and, and, and we, we toss it around, but we don't necessarily always have a clear idea, even in our own minds, what faith actually means. We experience it, we use it, but sometimes if we were asked to define it, we'd be like, well, uh, faith is uh, it's one of those, it's, uh, it's a hard word to nail down. So I thought as we'd start, we would talk just a bit about what faith means or kind of establish somewhat a working definition. As I prepared, I looked up some definitions of faith. Uh, the first one I read was a complete trust and confident or confidence in someone or something. And I thought that that's a, that's a decent way to define faith, that we have total confidence in someone or something. Now, that definition isn't exclusively spiritual. You could have complete confidence in a spouse or in a child who's always proven to be very reliable at providing for your needs or being there as a constant source of relationship. Uh, read another one, and I'm not as crazy about this one, and I'll tell you why. It says, a strong belief in God or in the doctrines of a religion. I had no problem with that. But it says, based on spiritual apprehension rather than proof. That's where I began to push back a little bit. I see, when I practice faith, I do it because I believe I have proof. Uh, I have proof of God's character that's recorded in His Word. I have proof of stories in his word about how he's cared for people in the past. How he's ensured his work and his plan got accomplished in the past. See, I don't feel I have an absence of proof when I practice faith in God. I believe it's quite the contrary. Because of the proof, I know I can have or live my life according to a faith in God. Because he's proven himself true to me through his word and my own life experience. I know he's reliable. So as we practice faith, it's not just some mystical feeling we have or some, some strong belief that it's going to be okay. No, we do so based on proof we can read in his word. 
uh, one verse that begins to define it. One thing I appreciate is found in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, where the author of Hebrews writes, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Uh, the author of Hebrews in that passage, where uh, he's beginning to really focus on faith for a few chapters, talks about strong, not just a strong feeling or a strong emotion, but a strong belief in things that, we, that are not tangible. But we have so believed them that we have come to know that they're true. Because again, they're reliant upon God's character, which we can always trust. They are, our faith is reliant on his ability to work because we know he can. Uh, but it says it's the conviction and the assurance of things we can't see, but we know they're true. Uh, one way I'd, uh, I'd like to kind of combine some things, and just for today, and we won't always have to define faith like this, but some notes I jotted down on what faith is, is that is a, it, faith is a firm belief and conviction of God's ability to impact our situation based on how he has taught, on what he has taught us regarding his character, his power, and his affection towards us. That faith is a firm belief and conviction of God's ability to impact our situation based on what he has taught us regarding his character, power, and affection towards us. See, faith is not blind. I've heard the expression blind faith. I've never practiced blind faith. I've taken some moves that required a lot of faith, and not just physical move. I've done some things uh, in ministry right where I was at that required me being convinced that God was challenging me to do that, and he was going to carry the ball when my best effort was no longer good enough. But it was never blind, because God has proven himself true and reliable. Faith is not naive. It's not like we're ignoring the realities of the world or our situation. It's we believe that God is more powerful than our situation and has a desire to work in our situation as well. And faith is not dumb. Faith is not because we don't understand enough or we don't know enough or, or we, we've got our heads in the clouds as believer. No, faith is because we looked at the evidence and said, no, I can trust this in my own life. So I wanted to, to kind of dispel some myths and dis establish kind of how we can think on faith as we use that as a term today. And then we will begin to look at the life of this Roman centurion and see how he exercised faith. Because the same way he exercised faith is the same way we can exercise it as well. The things that proved to be so effective for him will be effective for us as well as we strive to trust God with our lives and honor him and live in such a way that makes him proud. Uh, the first thing we learn about faith from the Roman centurion is that we need to recognize God's work as the solution. We need to recognize God's work as the solution. Let's read verse 5 and 7 out of chapter 8, where it's written, When he entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. So in those first few verses, we introduce the two main characters. Excuse me, we've got Jesus, uh, who's preparing to perform a miracle, but we also have a Roman centurion. Now, yes, we have the, the paralyzed um, servant, but he, he's just the example that's used to teach us this faith. So, yes, he's important, and he receives the miracle, but it's really the faith of the centurion we want to focus on today. Uh, centurion meant that he was the leader of a hundred Roman army men. That, that's, uh, we, we draw that, you got century, 100 years, you've got a centurion. Um, he leads a hundred men in the Roman army. So he's got some level of influence, some level of authority, and is used to some level of power. But we also see that uh, he was likely, what, and based on what we've learned from history, 
that his group was probably based near Capernaum. Capernaum was the, uh, was the home base for Jesus' Galilean ministry. That, that's, Jesus traveled a lot. Today we may call him more of an itinerant minister. But he always kept circled back through Capernaum. It was his home base. Uh, we don't know if he owned a home there or one of his disciples. We don't even know why he necessarily picked that town. But he always circled back to Capernaum when ministering in Galilee. So as this Roman leader's army is stationed near there, he became incredibly familiar with the work of Jesus Christ. No, Jesus had a following. He was, getting some, uh, he was getting some attention from the world around him, not just the spiritual figures he led. When several thousand people begin to follow someone and listen to them, that gets the attention of everybody in that day. So he becomes more and more, this centurion becomes more and more familiar with the ministry of Jesus. It's also true the centurion, from what we know now, looking back, was likely what they would have called a God-fearer. A, uh, a God-fearer is a Gentile who doesn't join Judaism, but associates himself or, or relates spiritually to the God of Judaism. So he doesn't join their religious structure, but his spiritual life is geared towards the same God that the Jews worshipped. So we also see him with an affection, or he's beginning to look towards Jesus as a spiritual source. And as we continue to learn more and more about the centurion and how that works out, as he comes to Jesus, he recognizes he has a problem. He's got a problem in his life. That's the fact that his servant is paralyzed. His servant's paralyzed. That's his problem. And it drove him towards Christ. And he recognized God's work or the work of Jesus Christ as the solution to the problem. We don't know why his servant's paralyzed. Uh, no medical reasons given. No, no solution. We just know he is. And we also know from what the centurion says, it's causing a great deal of pain and suffering in his life. A great deal of pain and suffering in his life. But we see he's willing to go to someone who can solve the problem. Now, I don't know, again, did he try medical? I don't know. I don't know what all solutions he tried, but eventually today we see that he went to God as the source of work. That the way his faith played out is when he had a problem, he trusted God's work and ability to be the one that could solve it. When he needed a solution to something he was facing in life, he found that it was God's work and ability that could solve the problem we face. You know, we all come against, up against problems or challenges in our own life. Uh, they can be medical. They can be financial. They can be a relational challenge. Faith says that no matter what else I do, I've got to recognize God's work as a solution to the challenge I'm up against. That while I may get the best doctors I can find, it's still God who can provide the ultimate healing. Faith says we go directly to the source to solve our problem, and our source as believers it still leads us to be dependent upon God's work in our lives. I once heard the story uh, about Henry Ford. Henry Ford uh, founded and obviously still the name holder of Ford Motor Company, which started with the Model T. And uh, Henry Ford was driving along the road one day, not too long after uh, the first round of Model Ts went out from production and were sold. And uh, he's driving along, comes across a man who's pulled over on the side of the road. And uh, his Model T is broken down. Henry Ford pulls up behind him. He goes to the gentleman and says, Hey, what's the, what's the problem? And he says, my, my car quit running. And uh, he did not know who he was talking to. Uh, Mr. Ford looked at him and said, Well, would it be all right if I took a look at it? This man said, Sure. And he, uh, story told that Henry Ford tinkered with it for a minute, changed a few things. He said, Give it a try now. Started right up. He said, How did you know how to do that? Henry Ford just smiled and said, because I designed the car. How great was it that when, he, that when that man needed help, 
He had the most knowledgeable and powerful person to provide help in that situation. You know, one mistake we can make as believers is we'll face some sort of challenge in our life. And instead of recognizing God's work as the solution, we take it upon ourselves to find a solution. Instead of recognizing, instead of going directly to the source, we go to another, another method. Instead of being fully reliant upon God and recognizing that He can impact my situation. We take it upon ourselves to come up with a solution and leave him out of the process. Now, I don't believe that, I don't believe that faith and effort are opposite things. I believe they often work together. In fact, I think faith and effort can work together really well. But even in the midst of doing our best when we're up against a challenge, faith is still when we recognize that, you know what, no matter what I do, or no matter my best idea it's still God's work that will solve the problem. You know, there's a lot of things in life that our effort can do. Our effort can teach a great Sunday school class. But it's only the work of God that can bring life transformation and life change. Uh, our effort can work and invite and plan, but only God can grow our church. Our efforts can send people to Haiti and prepare them and send them with supplies and get them as ready as possible. But it's the only work of God, it's only the work of God himself who can draw attention to himself and make that a lasting spiritual impact based on our efforts. Faith recognizes that while God, I believe, calls us to address our challenges, we're always recognizing that he's the one that can really solve the problem that I don't believe we should just always sit idly by waiting on God. No, I think that when we're up against a challenge, we should move in that direction. But as we do that, we've got to recognize that it's the work of God that can bring the solution to our problem that we're wanting. We read a, a, from our centurion that he has a problem. There's something in his life that's not going well. And because of that, he seeks out Jesus Christ as the solution to his problem. He knew that Jesus was capable of healing. He knew that Jesus had already healed someone that was paralyzed. So when he came up against a problem, he went directly to Christ to solve it. How many times in our own life is that our last resort? How many times do we face a problem and exhaust all our options and say something like, I guess I'll just pray about it and see what God can do now. No, that shouldn't be like that. Faith recognizes that God's work is the solution to our problems. Yes, we're to be wise with the effort we make and the steps we take and the knowledge we implement, but no matter how good we are, no matter how good our best effort is, we still rec recognize that for our life's challenges, Jesus Christ is the answer. And it's his work that will solve the problem we're up against. Next thing we learn about faith from the Roman centurion is that faith acknowledges God's perfect power. When we practice faith, we are acknowledging God's perfect power. Uh, it took a tremendous belief in God for this centurion to go find Jesus. But he recognized from what he had seen and experienced, he recognized God's perfect power in his life. Uh, as we look at verses 8 and 9, we read that, But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Now think about this. Jesus is a Jew. Romans were Gentiles. According to Jewish custom, if a Jew went into the home of a Gentile, he was unclean. Now, one thing that stuck out to me is this centurion is sensitive enough to Jesus' religion that he would not do that to him. He would not do that to him because he also recognizes it doesn't have to be that way for God to work. That Jesus didn't have to be physically present. 
Sometimes in our own minds, we determine that if God's going to work in this situation, it's got to happen exactly this way and inside this little box. God doesn't have to work inside our little box. Most of us, probably in that situation, would have been angling to get Jesus into our home. He says, I don't even need you to go to my home. Now, I said that stuck out to me. One thing that also stuck out to me about that is in that day, those Roman officials just had an immense amount of power. And they led, in a lot of ways, through fear. Because you just simply didn't push back against a Roman governing official. That Roman, the, the Roman centurion in that day would have been perfectly within his perceived power to walk up to Jesus and said, we're coming to my house now. And the expectation would have been that Jesus would have followed. Because that happened all the time. That Roman soldiers simply took and got what they want because of the power they had through the Roman government. Today, we don't live within that, that realm. I have a tremendous amount of respect for our military. I've got friends and family who are in the military, both actively in the reserves. We never do anything to dishonor them. But if I was going throughout my daily routine and one of them came and said, you're going to come to my house right now, I'd probably say, no, thank you. The centurion could have just demanded that Jesus did what he wanted to do. But he wasn't going to force Christ into that situation. He says, I don't even need you to come to my home. And then he goes a bit further. He says, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. See, like I just said, the centurion recognized Jesus' power is not limited to, limited to his physical presence. When we look at our situations, Jesus' power is not limited to his physical presence. The centurion said, you don't have to come to my house to make an impact on this situation. You can work just where you are. Verse 9 talks a bit about the power that the Roman centurion would have had and it, it's written he says that for i too am a man under authority with soldiers under me and i say to one go and he goes to another come and he comes and to my servant do this and he does it see the centurion recognizes that i've got complete I, he understands authority he understands power and how that works he says because I'm a man under authority. If his commanding officer said, do this, he had to do it. When he looked at his men, if he said, do this, they were expected to do it. He recognized the authority that Christ has, and he said, you can simply say the word, and this can happen. He recognizes the power that Jesus has, because his heart is saying, you can stand right where you are, and heal my servant who is in a home that you can't even see because it's across town. He recognized God's perfect power and authority. Now, I believe we live in a culture that has an authority problem. We live in a culture that doesn't really want to embrace authority. And I'd probably say a lot of you would agree with that. We look at our maybe some of our young people with the disrespect they have for their parents. Uh, many of us have looked at the law enforcement culture and recognized that there's an authority problem there. They're not given the respect they deserve. But this authority problem has not escaped the church or the Christians either. See, the, the centurion shows us he recognized Christ's authority. There are many, many, many believers who are okay with Christ's authority until he tells us to do something we don't want to do. And that's a spiritual problem we've got to fix in our own lives. And that's something that I'm not even exempt from. I'm perfectly fine with God's authority until he tells me to forgive someone I don't want to forgive. I'm perfectly fine with God's authority unless he were to come and tell me to do something I don't want to do. But that's where Christ's authority is supposed to be. Roman soldier recognizes how much power God has. And faith recognizes that God has perfect and unlimited power. And we have to remember that. 
excuse me, um, one barrier to our faith and one barrier to our exercising faith is when we forget how perfect God's power is. One thing that can challenge our ability of exercising faith in a particular situation is when we fail to rec- recognize that God can still impact this. That no matter what we're facing, God can have an influence over that situation. See, many of our challenges in life are very real. They're not made up. And they're very personal to us, and some of them are very large. We can't forget that God can still, still has power to work over the challenges we're facing in life. When we're facing pain or, or grief or hurt from a source, we've got to remember God can still walk us through that. He still has power over that. That doesn't mean he'll take it away, but it does mean he can walk us through it and that his authority isn't limited there. When we face some other challenge, we've got to realize that God's power and authority can still work there, whether it's financial or relational. When we face uncertainty because we don't know how a situation in life is going to turn out, we've got to remember that while I may be unsure, God knows what's going to happen. He's working a plan, and he has the power to bring this all together for my best interest. Faith recognizes God's personal power. See, that Roman centurion knew some things or recognized some things about God that some of those following him hadn't caught on to yet. He recognized that God had unlimited power. He recognized that not only was it unlimited, but it was not tied to his presence or a particular model that God could work any way he wanted to. And because of that, he looks at him and says, I don't need you to come to my house. Just need you to say the word, and he knew that his servant would be healed. We've got to remember that God's power is not limited in any way, and that no matter what we face, faith says God can still work, and I'm going to trust him. I may hurt, I may be unclear, I may not know how this is all going to turn out, but I'm going to trust in God and the plan he's working and the character he has proven in my life. Faith remembers God's perfect and unlimited power. The third thing I want us to walk away with from the centurion's life is that faith displays a steady confidence in God. Excuse me. Faith displays a steady confidence in God. Now, that steady is a big word to me because I like things to be steady and very predictable and very even. I'm not one of these people who goes home and changes the furniture in the living room because it's been there in the same place too long. I like things to be steady. And faith is not fed by emotion. Sometimes our emotions do this based on the day or based on what's going on. Our faith doesn't need to follow that. Faith doesn't need to follow our hurt or our fears. Our faith needs to be very steady and predictable, saying... I have confidence in God. My emotions may be all over the charts. My fears may be all over the charts. But my faith, it's sturdy. It's predictable. It's going to run baseline through this situation, no matter what it is I'm facing. These are a loaded few verses. I'm going to read verses 10 through 13 for us. And Jesus says a lot through these. He says, When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many have come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness in the place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to the centurion, Jesus said, Go, and let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. Jesus does two things. He he teaches on eternity in the midst of this. He starts by giving this incredible accommodation to uh, to this centurion, saying, The faith like yours is just highly uncommon. That amongst all I have seen from the people I came to first, from the Israelites, from my own people who have been relating to for so long, I've not found faith like yours in them. 
But here you are, this Roman official who yourself has power and authority, and you're willing to look at my power and authority as the solution to your life's problem. He, he, and I think he's saying that not just to the centurion, I think he's saying that to the people around him who are listening, and saying, look at this, this is what I am looking for out of you. You see his faith? You need to mimic that in your own lives. So he gives this incredible accommodation to the Roman centurion, and he praises him and props him up as an example of faith, but he also teaches on eternity. He says, like I read, I'll tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham and uh, Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus teaches on eternity. There will be a time when those with faith in God and his work, what we would now call salvation, will get to spend eternity in heaven. You know, we've had some painful funerals over the last few weeks. But they're all strung together by the reality that the people we lost are now spending eternity in heaven. What a great hope we get to have. We remember that. Jesus is teaching on the reality that heaven's a real place, but it takes faith to get there. That all sorts of people are going to be there because people from the Jewish culture and the Gentile and the Roman culture. And now we've seen cultures just expand exponentially. People from all those groups are going to find faith in Jesus Christ. And we will join them in heaven one day for all those of us who have chosen to exercise the faith that salvation requires. Jesus teaches on a little bit what heaven will look like. And he also teaches on the reality of hell. Now, in my life, I always want to be moving towards something instead of running from something. I always want to be moving towards a goal. I, if I uh, manage my diabetes and I'm trying to eat healthy and exercise, it's so that I'm moving towards the goal of health and fitness, not just running away from the fears. Uh, when we aim to co- accomplish a financial goal, we always think about how great it will be when we achieve that instead of how bad it will be if we don't. So well, that's impacted not my view of heaven and hell, but just how I often talk about it. Um, I would much rather us think about what eternal life can be like if we choose to follow what the Bible teaches on salvation. I'd much rather us think about who we can take along if we follow what the Bible teaches us about missions and evangelism. But as I talk predominantly about going to heaven don't ever hear that as me dismissing the reality of hell hell's a very real place god does not want us to go there but he will not tolerate unforgiven sin into his eternal kingdom you know i believe we all enter eternity prepared we're either preparing ourselves for heaven or by rejecting the good news of the gospel we're preparing ourselves for an eternity of hell No one enters eternity unprepared. It's just based on what decision they made and how they prepared themselves spiritually for all eternity. Jesus teaches on the very reality, the reality of both eternal destinations, heaven and hell. We have to remember that. Um, Yes, I would much rather talk about going to heaven. I would much rather challenge people to say, hey, this is what you can obtain if you will answer the call, the, the, the invitation of, of salvation that God has given you. But let's not forget that there's a, an opposite reality that it exists. Uh, again, he gives this incredible accommodation to the Roman centurion, and he simply says at the end, go, your, your request has been granted. Go and let it be done for you as you have believed. God challenges us to a life of faith. God challenges us to a steady belief in Him and His character and what He can do and accomplish in our lives. It's the faith that was so appealing to Christ. This unexpected source, someone who did not grow up, in the same religious structure that Jesus did, 
someone who was not constantly one of his followers, like the people who were traveling with him in ministry, still found this level of faith, still achieved this level of faith. It simply was a reality that this centurion believed. He knew who God was and was willing to trust him as the source of his solution. See, faith, sometimes we talk about great faith, and it's, it's these larger-than-life examples of people that have, have, in very specific situations, had to do something that required a huge sacrifice. And that is a tremendous level of faith. And God is honored by that, but God is just as honored when we simply live a day-in and day-out confidence in God's ability to work in our lives. When we regularly just show confidence in God's work and His power and His character. You know, today we don't, we don't talk about anything new. This story is probably very familiar uh, to many of you. As I said when I started, we all... Here, probably this morning, have exercised some level of, of faith in Jesus. Beginning with our salvation, extending on, we've learned to trust God in other aspects of our lives. Today's just kind of a refresher course for us. What does faith really look like? I think the challenge for us is to look at our, maybe look at our next week. What areas of our lives are we struggling to trust God in? What, area, what challenge are we up against that seems larger than life? And God's simply saying, just trust my work as a solution to this problem. Trust me, just don't let your emotions drive how you view me. Just maintain that steady confidence in God and his work. Just a moment, Pastor Don's going to come up and we'll, uh, we'll begin to close our time out. Uh, uh, another time of worship, as he does that, I do what I just challenged you. Just think about your next week. What areas of our lives are requiring faith now? What challenge are we up against? And begin to work through what we talked about. Do we see God as the solution to that? Or are we trusting a a man-made solution? Do we really believe God's powerful over that situation? That he can impact if he chooses? And are we willing just to display a confidence in God? So let me pray for us and then Pastor Don will come up. Lord, we thank you so much for today and all you're doing in our lives and the life of our church. Just pray that you would be with us over the next few moments, uh, that as we think upon what we read about and what we talked about, that uh, we would allow ourselves to be challenged in the areas of our lives that we're not trusting you with, Um, areas of our lives that we've let fear or worry take over and that's clouded out um, our view of your ability to work. Just be with us now as we... uh, begin to close down this part of our day, uh, help our ears and our hearts to be open to anything you may be wanting to get our attention on. It's in your name we pray. Amen.